Thank you very much. And if I can just get out of this, I think. Uh, let's see. I'm just going to minimize that, and then I can probably find mine. There we go. Okay. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to come speak to you about feral horses in the West. Uh, somebody asked me, why are they feral and not wild? Well, under the Wild Horse and Burrow Act of 1971, they're called wild. But as a scientist, any species that's domesticated and then released into the wild is called feral. And I work internationally as well. And so when I'm talking to colleagues in Mongolia that actually have uh, native Shavalskis horses, uh, they're confused if I call them wild, so we always say feral. Okay, so uh, before I start, I just want to acknowledge my co-PIs on all the research that I'm doing, our crew leader who's helped collect all of the data. We have many field technicians and lots of volunteers who've helped do the work, and uh, we are funded and very grateful to the Wild Horse and Burrow Program, BLM, and to USGS that has supported this work. So. What I'm going to talk about today is first I'll give you an overview of sort of the evolution and history of horses, how they got here, the sort of shifting view, our shifting view of animals in America and our differing relationships with them. We're going to talk about Wild Horse Annie, and then we're going to talk about the controversy. This is a very controversial subject in the West. Um, so we're going to talk about the impact of horses on Western ecosystems, and then I'm going to um, go through some of the projects that we're working on to try to um, bring some science to the table. So the Equidae uh, evolved in North America. There were at least 27 species of Equus during the Pleistocene. Horses radiated through Beringia, the temporary land connection between North America and Asia, and there were multiple extinctions and repopulations in North America. Yeah, for two to three million years. Then horses went extinct in the great Pleistocene megafaunal extinction. So all these other species went extinct at the same time. Camels, mammoths, saber-toothed cats, the dire wolf, the cabaloid horses, which is what I'm talking about tonight. Uh, bison antiquus, those were the giant bison that were found in um, great sand dunes. Uh, giant sloths, Irish elk. It is believed that they went extinct because of rapid and variable climate change, which caused a contraction of grasslands in North America. That's one theory. Also, uh, competition with ruminants may have had a, a, a role in that as well. The ruminant species are very efficient in their digestion. They can eat food. They have to eat higher quality food, but when they do eat it, they can really take a lot of nutrients out of it. And also for carnivores, perhaps it was just the loss of that prey. Uh, it's thought that maybe native um, human overhunting had a role, but really what it did is gave rise to the, um, you know, to the emergence of all the modern species. So um, equids continued to evolve, though, in Asia, where they still survived, and uh, eventually domestication of horses occurred, but that was like 6,000 years ago. So horses have been domesticated for a very, very long time. It was primarily for uh, milk and meat. The very first, um, and this was actually in, in what's today Kazakhstan, but what they've discovered in the Botai culture is corrals where they probably milked the mares, um, first of all. And also, it's important to note that the distribution of horses today really is about human distribution, that horses uh, went with humans everywhere. So today there are seven extant native species of horses of the Equids family remaining. There's Shavalski's horses. These are the, uh, the true wild horse in Mongolia and, and actually Asia. Uh, Grevy zebra, plain zebra, and mountain zebra. The Asiatic wild ass and the African wild ass and the Kayang. Almost all of these are um, threatened or endangered species. Then we have the feral burrow or donkeys, it, which is basically, we have these here, they're the domesticated variety of African wild asses. And in the United States, we have some Nubian subspecies and some other subspecies of African wild asses. And no one's done a lot of genetic work on them yet, but I think that that's coming. And then we have the domestic or feral horse, um, and that's really what I'm gonna talk about today. <coughs> 
So uh, horses came here on the second expedition of Christopher Columbus. That's how they got here. We know this because of the Queen's manifest, the cargo log on the Spanish ships told us what was on those ships. After being brought to North America, horses became a very integral part of our culture. Uh, when the Indians got the horses, they you know, used them in warfare, they used them to hunt, they really became a part of their culture. And horses basically pulled our wagons out west and they helped us plow our fields. And we rode them into war. So they're really <coughs> closely tied to uh, you know, I would, I would even say co-evolution. Our cultural evolution is very tied to horses. So they're really beloved. But what happened is with the evolution of transportation, the invention of automobiles, they basically made horses less necessary. Motorized tractors, tanks, and other machinery replaced the role of horses in warfare and tillage. And horses really were no longer required, and they um, became more companion animals. Um, there's a terrific paper, Why Are Humans So Emotional About Feral Horses, by uh, one of my colleagues that is, is worth reading and kind of chronicles all of this. Also at this time in our history in the United States, we had changing views and a changing sense of how we valued animals. Uh, the Humane Society was founded in 1954, and really the start of the modern animal rights movement was around the 1970s, you know, early 1970s. So these horses that uh, were no longer used in many areas, they were either released in the West or they just simply escaped and they formed feral populations. Then come the Mustangers. In the 1950s, the Mustangers um, would go out and they would catch horses and they would, um, they would sell them for um, dog food or for, you know, they, for slaughter, for whatever. They, they used the horses and they um, basically went out and captured them. But it was images like this that disturbed people with everything else going on. This was very disturbing to see animals being treated like this. And um, so along came Wild Horse Annie. So Velma Johnson... Uh, started a letter writing campaign with um, elementary school kids in Congress. So all these elementary schools all across the country, they um, sent letters and she had pictures like that and such so people could see what was going on. And um, Congress passed the Wild Horse and Burrow Act in 1971 to protect horses from harassment and from um, you know, being captured like that. <coughs> So we're gonna fast forward now to today. So that was back in 1971. We did a great job protecting horses. We did a really good job protecting horses. And so today their populations are very high. And uh, I, I wanna show you this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just move over here so I can point. So if you look at the, the green bar, is that's the on-range population. So these are all the horses that are out in the West on all the herd management areas. So, BLM manages the herds in the West for the most part. Um, Forest Service does some too, but uh, most of them are on BLM lands. Anyway, um, so those, these horses are all out in the wild and you can see the population going down and then the population coming back up. I don't have an updated slide, I apologize, but in 2014, there were 48,000 horses in the wild. So then this is the black line, the black bar, I'm sorry, is, um, is the, the um, off range population. Those would be animals that have been rounded up and brought in and made available um, for the public to adopt. So all the horses that are rounded up and, and taken off the range, they're taken off the range because there's a certain number that are, um, it's called an appropriate management level, but you, you can't have too many of any ungulate. You, they have to be managed. And so um, as the, you know, the, as the population on the range keeps going up, they want to be able to remove more and put them in a holding or let the public adopt them or do something with them so that uh, they're not um, causing habitat degradation on the, on the range, on the Western rangelands. So um, that's what's going on now. So in 2014, there were 48,000 animals. In 2019, there was 89,000. So I want you to just think for a minute about how quickly that population nearly doubled. Um, horse number, horses are very in, incredible. They survive, they have very high survival. Uh, they're very fecund, they are, are very successful 
having babies every single year and um, they have high foal survival as well. So they do really well and they do really well in areas where there are no people like in the Great Basin. They have a digestive system that um, allows them to really eat anything. Uh, they, can, they can get a little something out of any junk and, uh, and they just need water and they can survive and they are really, um, they're very persistent. Um, also, so when we talk about the off range, um, the off range horses. So these horses that are rounded up and they're put into a holding facility somewhere or a pasture or the government off, um, BLM contracts with private landowners to say, will you house horses on your land? We just need to inspect it, make sure you have the right facilities and then we will put wild horses on your land and we'll pay you to, to, feed, to feed them. So those costs today are $49 million every year. So every year, that's what we are paying um, for all the horses that have been removed from the range that, that don't have homes, and we just keep paying for them. So this is controversial. This is really controversial. And part of it has to do with just this conflicting societal views on horse management. For the most part, and the, I'm painting with a little bit of a broad brush, but ranchers will say horses are destroying rangelands and they're destroying livelihoods. And that is true because I have been standing there when a tra trailer rolled up with all their cattle and said, um, there's nothing for my cattle to eat. Uh, I have a permit to, to graze my cattle here, but there's nothing for them to eat. And so I can't leave them here. And then they keep driving. And then the horse activists will say, horses are cultural icons and have special legal protection. And they are correct. They do have special legal protection. Horses are protected by the law um, they're protected by the Wild Horse and Burrow Act, and they do, have, they do have special status. However, they can't be managed at the expense of everything else on, on the land. Um, the real issue, and what's very challenging, I think, for the agency that manages horses is the Bureau of Land Management, and they have a multiple-use mandate from Congress. So Congress said to them, you have to manage the land for wildlife, human recreation, oil and gas, wild horses and cattle grazing. That's a big handful to try to make all that balance. So it's very challenging. Um, the wildlife conservationists will say, well, horses are ruining habitat for all the other wildlife species. And they're right, because I'm gonna show you some evidence that horses are having some big impacts and they're really affecting other wildlife now. And Congress says horses cost too much money. And they're right, $49 million is too much. So let's kind of go through each of these controversial topics and look at some of these different viewpoints. Um, if we look at the projected population growth nationally of horses, and we look through time, and let's just say, here's what the appropriate management level, this is what is deemed as uh, you know, carrying capacity of horses, coupled with all those other things that have to happen on the land and everything they're trying to balance. So here we are, uh, you know, I can't point to it. Um, I'll just point it out. So 2018, if you look at where it is, that purple line tells you what the carrying capacity is of that landscape if you remove all the, the cattle. So let's just say, okay, uh, if, you, if you get rid of all the, um, the cattle on the land, it raises the carrying capacity of the landscape. So then you can have more horses on the landscape, but look where we are. Like we're already over that. You know, like we're already higher than, even if you did get rid of all the cattle. We're already beyond that in terms of the horse populations. Some of the, um, there's a great, a great synthesis paper that was written by Davies and Boyd uh, in bioscience about the ecological effects. It was a synthesis of all sorts of different studies. This is the best thing to read if you want to uh, know about some of the ecological effects of horses on Western rangelands. Um, but essentially, they, they do a lot of damage. They increase cheatgrass cover. Uh, they increase uh, uh, bare ground. They lower perennial grass cover. Um, they decrease species diversity. They spread cheatgrass. They reduce the seed bank in montane grasslands. They reduce the abundance of small reptiles and mammals. They increase soil erosion and compaction. And this list that I have here is not even remotely exhaustive. I mean, I haven't even covered half the studies that, are, that people have now done. This, this list is not updated. In terms of effects to other wildlife, Feral horses employ in interference competition with native ungulates by displacing bighorn sheep and pronghorn at watering sites. This is very challenging in arid ecosystems 
when everybody needs to get to the water. Uh, wildlife also were found, even small, small animals are found to abandon water sites when horses, where horses are present. So if, if horses are just using them, they won't even come when the horses are standing there. But when the horses walk away, they don't even use those sites. They um, will use sites that were fenced from horses. So somebody did an experiment and they fenced the, uh, the water sites and the, the other wildlife used the fenced areas only. Um, sage grouse have reduced nest success in areas with horses versus areas without horses. This is probably because of the heavy grazing and so when the grass gets so low from all the grazing, um, those chicks have nowhere uh, to hide. So they need some kind of cover so the chicks don't get depredated. <coughs> and horses also disrupt um, the lecking behavior of sage grouse. So there's a number of things. And also, just to keep in mind, you know, we live in an arid, we live in the arid west, you know. Horses inhabit the driest land in the most fragile ecosystems. They generally take a long time to recover from disturbance. So, um, and as we think toward the future, so this is the Great Basin in here, and that's really where the concentration of horses are. Um, they're amazing, they can survive there, they do fine there, and um, except they, as long as there's water for them, um, they, they can survive in this habitat. Um, but the thing to remember is that the future projections of any climate scientists are not for increasing rangeland productivity in the West. It's, it's decreasing productivity with climate change. So these areas aren't gonna get more productive for more ungulates or more grazers. They're gonna get less productive as we go forward. There's also just controversy with, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of other groups are starting to weigh in. This is a letter from a, um, a hunting group to Sally Jewell when she was the Secretary of Interior, you know, talking about um, these hunter groups were saying, you know, you need to do something about, about too many wild horses. Uh, the Wildlife Society, which is the professional organization for wildlife biologists and wildlife professionals, uh, they actually have a position statement on um, their position on feral horses and burrows in North America. And then this was an article from um, The Economist back in, what is it, 2016, uh, dollars in the wind, and they have a picture of uh, a BLM truck and the guys are shoveling out money and letting the horses just eat the money. Just go ahead and eat the money. So the bottom line really is that horses grow on average at about 20% across the West and the horse population is running away from us. And they're beautiful, but it's getting away from us. And the longer we wait, the harder it will be to, um, to solve. So let's um, talk some about solutions. Um, at USGS, we are the research arm of the Department of Interior. So all the federal scientists, our job really is to provide science support to our brothers and sisters in the DOI agencies. So when they have issues, we, we're very heavy on applied science. We're usually looking at tools and things to help them um, better manage wildlife or, or you know, whatever, whatever the issue is. So um, at USGS, we started off back in like 2003 or so, um, a guy named Francis Singer, who was um, my supervisor, he passed away in 2005, but um, we worked together from like 1996 to 2005. And he, in 2003, he developed with BLM a strategic plan for managing wild horses. And, and uh, they met with BLM multiple times and said, okay, what are your needs? What, what, do you knew, what do you need from us, from the scientists to better manage horses? And they came up with a good list. And the first thing on the list was, we just need to know how many we have. So can we, you know, let's start figuring out how can we count horses. Um, some other work, so that's where we started. Some other work we've done is looking at non-invasive methods to gather horse data using fecal DNA. So we just got this, um, an army of volunteers and just said, hey, do you wanna just come and work on the horse range? We'll go out three times a year, 10 days, we'll camp, and you're all just gonna go pick up dung, and it's gonna be great. And, they, and then a lot of people signed up, and so we had lots of volunteers, and we collected a lot of dung, and then we um, analyzed it, got um, fecal DNA out of it so we could identify the individual horse from it, and uh, we've been able to do quite a few things with that. Uh, we, we did studies, and we're doing studies on horse population, demography, and ecology. A lot of the information we have about horse ecology is, you know, 25, 30 years old. We know things have changed. What are their current growth rates? What are 
you know, how is it different on the landscape and how are the horses different? So we were, we've looked into some really just basic ecology of horses. Uh, we're developing a radio collar to um, track horses and burrows uh, with Oklahoma State University. Oklahoma State University is really developing an, an inner uterine device, so IUD for horses. We're going to talk about a gelding study that we've done. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some population modeling and um, some economic projections talking about those really high costs of managing horses. If I have time, I'll talk about um, the new studies that we're doing. So I'm only going to focus on the things that I've circled because I don't have time to talk about everything. The aim of our research is to quantify the effects of management actions on horse behavior. So we're interested in their social behavior and, and what it does to their group structure. Spatial ecology, where do they move on the landscape and their population growth rate, pre and post treatment. This is straight applied science. This is what DOI does. We're looking at um, you know, how, to support our, how to support the management. So we also field test new tools for management, like the radio collars, and we're doing all this to provide data to support management. So I mentioned the, the um, aerial surveys. We developed these two methods with USGS Bruce LeBeau and Jason Ransom. Both of them were published, and since um, 2012, BLM has been using these methods widely all across, the, uh, all across the West. And so we feel very comfortable about the number of horses now that we have much more confidence in saying, okay, yeah, we, we've been using this method uh, for a long time. That also enables us to calculate population growth rates because if you have multiple reliable um, aerial surveys and you have multiple population counts that you think are good and they're, you know, you trust them, you can put those together and start looking at population growth rates of your different herds over time. So we've started calculating, all, all of this is ongoing work still, but we've started calculating what are some of the herd growth rates across the west of these different populations, and they vary quite a bit. Some are very high and some are not so high. So eventually we'll start looking at what is driving that. Why are some herds growing faster and other herds are not? For radio collars, um, this is really, was really very important. So the ability to radio collar ungulates has greatly advanced our understanding of their habitat use ecology and improved our capacity for conservation. We use radio collars on all ungulate species. I'm an ungulate ecologist. So the background is really telemetry collars have been used for over 40 years, but rarely on horses. The reason for this is because there was a study in the 1970s that went awry. It was written up in the National Research Council. They put out a report. Um, and in that study, one horse died and other horses were injured by radio collars. So understandably, the Bureau of Land Management was very averse to using any kind of radio collar on horses. And so they didn't really want to do it, um, but there was a pilot study at the Sheldon National Wildlife Refuge where they did radio collar some horses, and that was a start. And then um, one of my colleagues and I started a study uh, with BLM horses. Uh, the, the need is that BLM managers need a way to individually mark and track and locate wild horses and burrows, just like we do for all other ungulates. So what we did first is a pasture study. So we were just interested in, okay, how can we get these to fit? We wanna make sure they fit right. So we tested them in a pasture and it ended up, we, we tested these little main transmitters. So we, we basically braided transmitters into their mane and their tail to see, can we just get a GPS something on them? And it'll, how long will it remain? How long will it, will it last so that we can track where the animal is going? And then we also tried the radio collars. Um, in the end of that, that publication should be out sometime this year. The collars fit actually very well on mares and jennies, but not so well on stallions, so we just dropped that. So we started a field trial, and we only put them on mares and jennies, and we're still doing that right now, and we've been getting good results. And the tail tags, um, so the main tags didn't work very well in the captive study because their, their friends came over and like chewed them all out. Um, but the tail tags actually worked really well, and they worked even better on uh, stallions. And so we're marking stallions now with these little GPS transmitters. We just braid them into their tails. And we put some out not too long ago um, with solar transmitters. They have solar panels, so the battery keeps getting recharged. It's a tiny little thing. Um, and then it, connect, it talks to the um, 
through cell service. And so it can send us the data. So this is really cool. And if it works, the thing about the tail tags is they do, the tail hair grows out. So eventually the, um, it'll be expelled. So they don't, it's a sh shorter acting solution, I suppose. So I just wanted to show you a picture of a mare wearing a radio collar. This is a little video. She's the, the grulia, this gray mare there, this grulia mare. She's wearing a radio collar. You can see she's just walking around grazing with the rest of her group. Um, but that's where it sits, right behind the ears. And we monitor them pretty closely to make sure everything's good with them and that they haven't had any um, wounding or anything like that. And it really looks great. We're very excited about it. It's been a lot of um, improvement in the material, the flexibility of collars and the communication systems. So next, let's talk about gelding. So gelding is something that's used uh, within the BLM. When they bring stallions off the range, they usually uh, castrate them because it's really hard to hold stallions. And so if they geld them right away, they can put all the males together and then they keep the females in a separate area. So it's, it's actually, um, it's quite common. And it's something that we, that's been used for a long time on multiple species. So what we did is in uh, Utah, this is in Conger and Frisco HMAs, which are in South Central Utah. Um, these are herd management areas that are managed by the Bureau of Land Management. These two areas, we had one herd that was a treatment, which was Conger, and one was a control, which was Frisco. And basically we put, a, you know, had a hundred horses out there. We put radio collars on them and started tracking them. We started collecting demographic behavior on both populations and behavior data collection. Then we did a gather. We didn't. BLM did the gather for us. And they gathered them and kept all the social groups intact. So they basically had them brought in each family group or social group at, at a time. And so uh, we were able to not disrupt any of the social structure of the population. Then we went ahead and had, you know, 50% of the males were gelded. Some of them were bachelor stallions and some of them were harem holders. And we wanted to know what happens to those harem holders. Are they going to lose all their mares? So anyway, we return, they returned to the range and uh, we collected a lot of data over two years, 2017 and 2018. This study is still ongoing. It's not going to be finished until the end of this year. We still have a field crew out there um, this year. And they'll be studying until September. And then this whole study will, will wrap up after that. But basically, our results were that... Um, at least in the first year after they were gelded, the, most of those gelded stallions kept their mares. We thought for sure they would, you know, the, the females were going to say, you know, he's not getting the job done. I'm going to have to go find somebody else. But they actually didn't leave. They didn't leave their stallions. And so there might be something else going on. We also are collecting genetic information on the horses. So we'll be able to look back at the foals and say, okay, who was your sire? If... Um, if it wasn't your stallion, because we know he was gelded, who was your sire? You know, and so then we can start looking and piecing together, well, how are they, how is this working here? So it's actually really, really interesting and very cool stuff. Um, harem sizes didn't change. We were expecting maybe there'd be changes in how many um, mares each stallion was keeping if uh, some of them were gelded. But you know what? A lot of them didn't lose their mares. And so it didn't make a difference. It didn't make any difference on the social behavior of the mares. Didn't make any difference on the stallion body condition. Um, the one thing that we did notice is distance to water, um, but it was pretty much what you would have expected anyway. So the gelding, so any of the stallions that were gelded, they were identical in terms of their distance to water, the two groups, as the intact stallions. What really made a difference though is in the springtime, there was a big difference between the harem holders and the bachelors. And that's simply because the stallions who had mares have to be close to water because those mares are lactating and they're kind of tied to the water. So the stallions that, um, um, the, if you had a harem, whether you were gelded or not, it didn't make any difference. You had to stay close to the water because your, your mares needed to be there. The falling rate went down slightly, and we won't really know until the end of this year whether it was, it's effective in terms of bringing the herd growth rate down. Um, but we did find that you know, that's about the same. So it did come down slightly in Conger. And then in Frisco, this was the control. They're roughly the same. So from year to year, it didn't change in Frisco. 
So our general conclusions so far, you know, like I said, we still have more data to analyze for the gelding study, but we found very little to no effect of gelding on social structure, on time budget of, and social behavior of individuals, body condition, movement rates. But again, foaling rate will be a better determinant um, at the end of 2020. And social structure and behavior by the end of 2020 will let us know um, if there's any longer term gelding effect that we haven't captured yet. So more to come, I guess. The next thing I want to talk about is some modeling that we're doing. Um, BLM has to use modeling to figure out how many, um, how many horses do they have, what is the projected population growth rate, so that they can figure out, well, how many do we need to remove off the land to get back to like the, the appropriate carrying capacity. To do that, um, they are using something now called Winequis. It's a, very, it's a solid population model, but it does have some weaknesses, and so we're trying to improve upon this. It's difficult to compare different management scenarios. It only saves outputs, not inputs, and there's no cost calculations. So you can't look at it and say, well, here's how much this management is going to cost. So we are developing Pop Equus, which is a tool to evaluate management options, out, which includes outcomes and costs. What we want to do is encourage the, um, the BLM to do more tinkering with management and think about, okay, well, if we do some removals and some contraception and some gelding or whatever, whatever the tools are at their disposal, um, to tinker with them and see how they might reach um, their goals. So our goal, our goal with the model was to make it accessible but powerful um, and encourage tinkering. It's a web application and it runs on R. It's geared to the BLM, but it will be, will be customizable. And we are expecting it to be released sometime in July of this year. That's our, that's our goal. The model structure of it is it's an age structured population model, a matrix model. It tracks individuals that are on the range and off the range. Um, and it calculates costs per head for, for animals that are on the range and animals that are off the range. So we're just gonna do a quick example. Um, if we have 130 animals in a population and the appropriate management level is somewhere between 90 and 150, helicopter gathers cost about 800 to $1,000 per horse. Whenever you round up horses, that's about what it costs per animal. And you can really never gather more than 80% of the population. It's very hard to do. It's hard to, I mean, getting 80% of the population is a lot because they're hard to catch. Um, and the different management options are removals, contraception, or sterilization. So when we just run that scenario, here's what we see. So if you have no action, you do nothing to the horses, here's the AML, so that's where you want to be, then the herd's going to grow up to here. Okay, so within 10 years, you're going to be up close to, up to 500. Um, if you were to use removals, you do a removal here, the population drops down, uh, and then it's going to continue to grow up, but it's still at the end of 10 years, it's going to be higher than, um, than your appropriate management level. If you use uh, contraception on the horses, it just increases slowly. But the contraception, you have to remember, you, you've got to handle those horses every year because it's only good for one year. If you were to sterilize or spay or something the, um, it, with whatever means, sterilizing is the only thing that keeps the population um, level or at least incorporating it into the management. That's not a scenario of sterilizing every mare, it's only um, some of them. So if we look at the costs of this, um, basically what it costs for um, on range, if you're gonna bring a, bring a mare in and give her contraception and turn her back out, or if you're gonna remove her, but then you've got large off-range costs because now she's in a holding pen and you have to pay for her. Um, if you were to spay her, it's about $250,000, or I'm sorry, $250, not $250,000, um, for, um, for the actual surgery and then um, she's turned back out. So in, that, in this particular scenario. So anyway, you know, the take-home messages of the modeling anyway, this modeling 
shows that you can't decrease populations meaningfully with just fertility control. There has to be other things coupled with using contraception to bring the populations down. It's just, it's not enough. Um, you need to treat with contraception 90% of the population every year in our modeling scenario. Those, that's really tough. It's tough to handle horses year after year. They are not, um, I mean, they hide. The second year you come and try to fly over them and bring them in, they aren't gonna, they're not gonna come in because <laughs> um, they know what it is and they, they just avoid the helicopter. Um, they're also very, most of the Western populations are unapproachable. So it's very hard to go out with a dart gun and um, get close enough to them to actually dart them and administer the contraception to them every year. However, I will say there are some small herds that are being managed with contraception because in a smaller herd where the horses are approachable, um, you can get close enough to dart them. And that's how some small populations are being managed right now. Um, sterilization is highly cost effective. Basically over that 10 year period to reach AML, uh, you could save a billion dollars. That's not small money. So I'm gonna mention some of the other studies that we're working on right now. Um, one of them is a sage grouse cattle and horses in sagebrush ecosystems. Um, we're doing this with another U our USGS partners in, um, in the West, in California. And um, that's really looking to tease apart the differing effects of cattle and horses on um, sagebrush ecosystems and how that might affect sage grouse. Uh, we're doing a study on mountain lion predation on horses in Nevada with the um, Nevada Department of Wildlife and Utah State University. Uh, one of the populations that we're looking at has a depredation on, basically the mountain lion diet is about 25% um, horses. So that's very interesting. Um, we're working with the Navajo Nation to help them figure out what is their population growth rate of horses on the, on the Navajo lands. So um, we're doing foal ratios, go out and everybody goes out during the same week and counts all the foals and how many foal, what the foal to adult ratio is. And then we use those data to calculate a growth rate. And we're also working on a um, donkey landscape ecology in Southern California with the Peaceful Valley Donkey Rescue and the University of California Davis. Um, the donkey rescue goes out and they collect, they, I, bet, I guess they're contracted to um, capture donkeys across Southern California like Death Valley and Mojave and um, Nassau Goldstone and Fort Irwin. In some of those areas they capture the donkeys and then they make them available for adoption. Uh, but what, what we're doing is putting radio collars on some of them and releasing them so we can find out more about their, their landscape ecology and we're taking genetic samples too to see how are they all related to each other and it's, it's quite, quite interesting. Okay, and that's all I have. So I'd be happy to entertain questions. All right, we have about 15 minutes for questions. Why did the radio she has to tuck into oh, that. Yeah. Why did the radio collars not work on statins? Because they're fighting? No, uh, no, we thought maybe that they were gonna mess with them. Yeah. It's a great question. Um, no, it had more to do with um, the stallions that we were working with had really big, thick necks in the, pa in the um, holding facility where they were. They were, you know, they were all fed. And so these guys were really big. They just didn't fit. They didn't fit right. Oh. Yeah. And so they, you know, like they would, they would flip forward over their face and like pinch their face a little. And it, it didn't look comfortable, but like one of them that happened and then, you know, we put it back on correctly. But another one, like you could see it kept going back and forth. The reason is that when, when the horses are grazing and their head is up and they're alert looking around, it's, their neck is very tight. And as soon as they put their head down to graze, it elongates and there's basically almost a 15 centimeter circumference difference between head up and head down. It just does. That's hard. What's that? But that just is a No, no, it, it was the same for the, um, for the mares, yeah. but they didn't have the problem, I think, because their necks weren't so fat. So we had some of the stallions that we worked with had more mare-sized necks. They weren't so fat. And they, those stallions did fine with the collars. Can they just make the size of we can <laughs> <laughs> No, no, because it's, it's that issue that is when their head is up, you make it really tight, you know, because you need it to be tight when it's up. 
as soon as the collar, their head goes down, you can't use stretchy so material. The change, in size. the change in size made it so then the, the neck is all yeah. stretched out and that collar flips over the ears. Yeah. And then they stand back up and it's really tight on their face. Yeah. And it just looks uncomfortable. <laughs> and it, and it, it won't work anyway. I mean, so anyway, we, we sort of gave up quickly on stallions because we wanted to develop a collar and we wanted to go with where we were having success. So we just said, you know, we're going to table that. We'll, we'll look at stallions another time. But right now we just want to find something that at least, uh, at least we can look at mares. Have yeah. They, have they tried to make contraceptives that last more than a year? Yes, we've been trying for 20 years. And yeah. it just, just it doesn't hard. work. Really? It, I mean, you know, remember Jurassic Park? I mean, yeah. life finds a way. It's yeah. just, they're just, you know what? It's really hard to find a contraception that works more than wow. one or two years. Yeah. But, they, but people have been trying for a very long time. It's just really, really hard. I'm going to presume that uh, having a hunting season would be uh, against the Wild Horses and Burrows Act. Excellent question. So As why not change the act and have a hunting season? Because that's a serious amount of meat for people to have fill their fridge with. And I'm sure people, hunters would be enthusiastic. Um, they probably would. I don't know. But... Um I, I know that I know that um, that brings up a lot of the cultural and emotional stuff about horses, you know, and so that's I don't know somebody can pursue that. I know I know the Navajo Nation did try to do that. They actually um, were going to have a hunt because they have a huge problem on Navajo lands. They have so many horses on Navajo lands, and they don't have the means to go out and do these big expensive helicopter gathers like. Um, like we do in the rest of the West. They can't afford that. So they opened it up and they were going to have a hunt. And um, they shut it down because they had so much um, public pressure from, from activist groups. So the politicians are not going to change. The, I presume it's against the act. So I presume the politicians are not going to do it because of the backlash. I presume you're right. <laughs> I don't know. I'm the scientist. I'm not sure, but I'm guessing that's exactly probably right. Yeah. Because that would seem to me to be the cheapest. Yeah. In fact, you can make money on it. I mean, you could make money off of getting rid of your horse problem by having a hunting season, selling permits. Yeah. No. Great comments. Great comments. Thank you. I mean, that's how we manage all ungulates. We need hunters. We need hunting on all ungulates to manage the population. It's a little bit. It's going to be yeah. as, as popular as the South Korean dog market, <laughs> dog food market, <laughs> for those of us who have right. horses and live with horses, and, and which is a still a good percentage of the American population, is not the kind of thing that someone that's going to be easy to sell. Horses are very, very, um, you know, you can form a very, very t close bond with a horse, and you wouldn't feel so happy about um, them being shot and chased and all that kind of stuff. So it'd be, it's tough. So yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it. It doesn't. They're still. Oh, they, they are. They are, yeah, and they, they have, have families, yeah, yeah. and they People have lives, see them. There's and icons of the there's West. a lot. There's a lot of human interaction with wild horses in terms of photography, in terms of visiting them and watching them run. It's it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Be there, and they're they're living so things. You could say the same Right. It's different. I'm just telling you it's different. You can disagree with me as much as you want, but I'm a horse owner, and I have many horses, and I rescue a lot of horses. I have horses that have been rescued off the BLM. I have friends who have horses. I will tell you it won't go over well. It won't be an easy thing to do. My question, however, was what's your, do you have an idea of what your end up, what your, what you think would be the best solution? And I know you're a scientist, so you may not have gotten your conclusions yet, but do you have an instinct or an intuition about where this might go? The, um, the modeling that we, d that we did suggests that the answer is for BLM to incorporate sterilizing mares into their management program somehow, whatever that looks like, whatever sterilization method that is. I don't know. Yeah, that but the right. modeling shows very clearly that that will lead them in the right direction, quickly. Yeah. Do you know, uh, Oops, I'm sorry. <laughs> Taken over. Do you know uh, what their bloodlines go back to like in Europe or Asia? Um, what is like the most common place? I, I don't know a lot about the genetics of wild horses, but I do know that they are not. Um, we thought for a while that there were really a couple really unique herds like that had really 
incredible Spanish markers, and we were all really excited and interested in those populations. Um, but it ends up that they weren't, they weren't, aren't really that unique, and that in fact most of the horses in the West are a mixture of a lot of different herds. Plus, um, management, so for genetic health reasons, you, ha you can't have populations that are too small, or and so BLM moves horses around sometimes too. Also, I think some horses are more interesting to the public. Paints, some horses are prettier. And um, so in some areas, I think they have moved horses in from one area to another area to say, yeah, the public's gonna be interested in these, they'll wanna adopt these. So um, I, I think they're all mixed up. I think the genetics are very mixed. At least that's my understanding. I'm not a geneticist, but that's my understanding. It struck me that your list of uh, uh, range problems, on, you had one slide there uh, that was a fairly extensive list, but you said it wasn't fully inclusive, um, was the same list that I would use on almost all of the ranges, the BLM ranges that I've been on all across um, the West with uh, out horses on them as well as with horses or burrows. So like why, um, like isn't our rangeland in trouble everywhere? Um, is our rangeland in trouble everywhere and that you're, could you just repeat the question? So it's, you're, well, it sounds like what you're saying, if I understood you correctly, is all rangelands don't look good right now and they're all stressed exactly. and it's not just areas where there are horses. Right. What, we, what, what most of these studies did and what people are looking at right now is specifically what is the additive of having an overpopulation of horses. Right. That's what it is. Yeah. And then can you contrast that with um, your work in Mongolia with the um, wild horse populations there? I only work with colleagues there. I'm not actually working with Shabelsky's horses and so I can't comment to that in particular, but um, yeah, so the, the only difference is that with horses, they're out there all the time and they're really ubiquitous. They can go anywhere. I mean, they're incredible. They just go right up and over the mountains, you know, they, they go wherever. Um, cattle are only out there certain times of the year and they're very, their numbers are very rigidly managed according to how much forage is there. So that's sort of the difference between cattle and horses. Uh, but yeah, I don't, I can't, I can't really speak to that other, to your other question about all rangelands are, so are stressed right now, but certainly there's enough drought that they all should be, but you know, so it's, it's exacerbating. I, I, I would say it this way. Yeah. In Rocky Mountain National Park, we studied elk there for a long time and the, um, elk were over browsing on willows and there were, and we, we said, we think you guys have too many elk you might want to do something because they're eating all your willows. There's nowhere for songbirds. There's nowhere for porcupines. And, um, and they went ahead and said, okay, we have to do something to reduce the number of elk. Um, were there other causes to the decline? Sure, there, there were some other causes to the uh, stress on that landscape. But the obvious thing was this is, this is additive and we, this is what we can manage for. This is what we can address. You can't really manage for drought, but you can manage for the number of grazers you have on the landscape. So when I'm driving across Nevada or through the Navajo Indian Reservation and I see a horse on the side of the road or out in, like, how can I tell that it's not some rancher's horse, that this is actually a feral horse? Um, or uh, like in the Navajo, it's like, well, everybody has horses and you're gonna turn your horse loose to graze. How can you tell the difference? Um, I can't tell the difference, but they can. <laughs> the owner. No, the um, no, they do. They have grazing specialists or grazing um, officials that are monitoring who's got horses, who's grazing, and which ones are feral. Yeah, they do know. They do know. And and the ones that are in pens, sometimes they're in <coughs> pens, and sometimes they're not in pens. But um, I mean, I sort of get what you're getting at, I think. But um, no, they have they have a much better handle on. Oh, so, on, on which ones are feral? One last question. Okay. <laughs> uh, the, uh, your slide that had the uh, number of off um, uh, or on range, off range, and then you had an adoption number at the bottom, and it looked like the highest adoption number that you had was in the six or 8,000 range some 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah. It's like down to like 2,000. Yeah. So 
they're taking these horses off of the public range and they're putting them in feedlots or holding pens mm -hmm. and feeding them, thus getting to that $49 million a year um, number. Is there any way to increase the number that are um, adopted or um, reduce the number that are in those feedlots? Because when you talk well, about that iconic image of a wild horse r running free on the range, you know, people aren't thinking of them standing around in feedlots. Well, of course not. But are they thinking about the degradation to the landscape when you have too many grazers on the land? Well, are you thinking about the horses that are starving? Because I've got pictures of horses that are starving. Yeah, I mean, there's... It's really, a, it's a, horrible. A 50-year-old 50, 50 law that's not working for the landscape, it's not necessarily working for the horses. Uh, who, who does that 50-year-old law work for? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm you, you got to talk to your congressman. Yeah, you two more questions. <laughs> yeah. Two more questions. So, so if they were kept to a manageable level, uh, population, yeah. is there evidence that these modern horses would be filling a niche that's left behind by the extinct Ice Age horses, or do they have too different of a ecology to do that? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. And the other thing, too, is that, I mean, that was 10,000 years ago. Right. How do, how do you know? How would you be able to know that? Okay. I don't think it's knowable. You know what I mean? Like, are they filling a niche during the Pleistocene? I, I don't know. They, well, I mean, is there, they went extinct. You know, people talk about rewilding things yeah. and reintroducing species and... I wonder if they would they be filling that kind of thing. If you, it's okay. Except, well, the thing is, you have to think about what the land was like 10,000, 12,000 years ago. Was it identical to today? <coughs> Probably not. So y y if you're thinking, okay, how did they fill that niche? Okay, great, they did. They went extinct. But then we've reintroduced them. And it's kind of a moot point because we brought them back. You know, they're back because of people. And we love them, which is why we're protecting them. And we love them, which is why we still want them out west. And they're a symbol of the west. We just need to manage them. Um, I was just wondering if there was uh, any management for wild horses when it comes to endangered species, or if the 1971 Act addressed that at all. Um, I know you mentioned greater sage grouse, and they barely missed the uh, designation for endangered species. Um, but I have to believe in all of that range there's a Preble's jumping mouse or something like that. Um, so do they, does that fall to U.S. Fish and Wildlife, to state managers? Um, do, do we ever pull I, state rights to manage horses on our own in competition, well, and, um, you know, against well, the States have tried. There are several states that have said, why don't you just turn over horse management to the states? We manage all the wildlife. We're responsible for the wildlife in our state. Why don't you state's let us problem. manage horses? Yeah. yeah. Um, so far, that hasn't been um, gone over very well. Um, but in terms of endangered species, I don't think it's really been tested yet. I don't think there's any horse range where, I mean, this is the first information that's coming out about sage grouse, and this is relatively recent. So there hasn't been a lot of study. I mean, I would even argue there's a lot we still don't know. And that, you know, when I give you that list of, well, look at all these studies, well, guess what? That's not really very many. And uh, there's a lot that we still don't know that, that hasn't been studied in terms of interactions with other wildlife. Yeah, because I have to imagine that dramatically impacts their sage grouse's wintering habitat because they don't move and if their vegetation is disappearing. Mm -hmm. cool. I'll be excited for that research. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I think Thank you, you, you should do it. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for a round of applause. Thank you.